heard about this guy named Fred out in West Texas. Where are you from? Midland. Midland. Lubbock. Way out in West Texas. He went to this high school full of witchcraft, full of drugs. But this young ninth grader, you know, brand new kid, coming into the high school with all the big people. He walks in and he didn't like it. He said, I'm going to change this. He walked in to the principal of the school. He said, I want to start a Christian prayer club at this school. The principal said, no, you can't. Fred said, why not? The principal said, separation of church and state. If you do it, I have to let everybody do it. He said, I want to start a prayer club here. The principal said, no, I can't give you permission for that. Fred said, okay, I'll start it anyway. So he went out in the hall. And he went and he found another kid that kind of sort of in a way more or less off and on was a Christian. And he said, come on, we're going to pray. They stood in the hall and they began to pray for their school. Every morning before school started, they got in the hall and they prayed for the school. Kids walked by, mocked them, teased them, made fun at them, threw pennies at them. But they kept praying. They'd pray for them as they walked by. You know, and God help him in Jesus' name, you know. <laughs> Teachers, everybody, they're praying. People giving them a hard time. After a while, there weren't two anymore. There were five. After a while, there were ten getting together to pray every morning. After several months, there were so many of them meeting there in the hall to pray before school that the students couldn't get through to their lockers. So the principal came out and said, look, you're going to have to stop this because you're clogging up traffic here. Fred said, give me a room then. He said, no, I can't do it. So Fred said, okay, let's take it outside. They took it outside, found a big old tree in the schoolyard, made it their prayer tree. Every morning, got under there and stood under the tree with his friends, and they prayed for that school. By the end of that school year, witchcraft almost did not even exist. Where Satanism was rampant, it was almost but gone. I mean, nobody could practice it or, or utilize any of its practices at school because these guys were praying. Drugs went, boop, it was gone. Why? Because somebody prayed. Somebody. Now that was several years ago. That was several years ago. Now they've got a thing, Equal Access, that was signed in as an act in 1984. It's now backed up by the Supreme Court. And you as a student have the legal right to start a Bible prayer club on your campus and no one can stop you. In fact, the only, the only reason that they could say no to you is if they knocked off every extracurricular club on campus and denied them access. That is the only way they can say, that, that they can say no to you. Otherwise, they have to say yes. We've got a generation, you guys are so tired of sitting around watching everything, you want to do it. That's why when Ron Luce said, hey, let's take a teen mania trip to Russia, he had more people sign up for Russia, for the Russia trip, than all the other trips combined. Why? Because the young people of today are tired of sitting around, they want to get up and go. I want to go someplace. Now, once you get to where you're going, you got to do something. So get your Bible. We're going to show you what to do tonight. Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to show you what to do. Matthew 28. You got it? In Matthew 28, verse 18, we'll read it again. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, or the King James says, Go, therefore, and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 and verse 15. Mark 16, 15. Do you guys have enough light out there? Okay. Jesus is talking, and he said to them, Whoa. Turn on the cross. Verse 15, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's you. Now turn back to Matthew again, Matthew chapter 4. So you don't have to do any of this on your own. You have the Holy Ghost. In fact, you couldn't heal anybody if you wanted to. You couldn't heal a Gannat. But Jesus can. Look at what he does. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when, his, when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then it goes on into his teachings and sayings. This first verse we read, Jesus went about all of their synagogues. He was doing three things. Here's what you're supposed to be doing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Okay? Now, what do we teach? teach Jesus. We teach the Word. We teach all things. Matthew 28, teaching them all things that I have commanded you. If you could wrap up the teachings of Jesus in two phrases, it would be this. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if you do these, you're fulfilling everything. You teach them. You take what you get taught and you go out and you teach it. Now, this word teaching, in Matthew chapter 28, when it says, go and teach all nations, in my Bible, the New King James, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. It, they both mean the same thing. That word teach means to make disciples. Now, let me talk to you about that for just a second. Making disciples. Now, I've got to tell you what this is because I don't want you to go out there and not know. Make disciples. How do you make disciples? What that means is to duplicate yourself. Duplicate yourself. Take what you've got and put it in somebody else. Duplicate yourself. Every time you learn something new, teach it to somebody. Duplicate yourself. You say, I have no outlet. I have no opportunity. Create one. Find one. I like Bobby Bogart's testimony. When he first got called to preach, he didn't have anyone to preach to, right? So he went out in the field next door and there were cows out there. So he'd preach at the cows. Stand up on a stump and preach to the cows. What was he doing? He's practicing. <laughs> fulfilling his call. Amen. Teaching them, making disciples of them. Teaching, get into the Word. 
<laughs> I was in Arkansas. I was at a meeting. He gave an altar call at the end. This young man came forward and got saved, got born again. About a week later, he went to the youth pastor at the church there. See, this guy, he never knew anything about Jesus. His parents weren't saved. He came to the youth pastor. He said, I just got saved last week at, at a meeting with Spencer Nordi. I just got born again. And I need to know what to do. What should I do? The youth pastor said, well, you need to read the Bible. He said, okay. Guy came back two weeks later. Came to the youth pastor and said, well, I did it. Youth pastor said, did what? He said, I, I did what you told me to do. You said to read the Bible. I read the Bible. Youth pastor looked at him and he said, you read the whole thing? He said, yeah, I went home like you said and I read, I read the whole thing. He said, I didn't understand it all, but, you know, but I'll get it. In two weeks, he read the whole Bible. In two weeks, brand new Christian. Went and read the whole thing. He was tired of sitting around. He didn't have one at home. The youth pastor had to give him one. But he took it home and read the whole thing. Then you know what he did? He found a place that would let him have a Bible study. This guy had only been saved a month. He found a place where they would let him have a Bible study. He couldn't have it at home. His parents weren't saved. So he found a place where they said, okay, yeah, sure, you can have a Bible study. And he started a Bible study. Say, so what did he teach him? Well, they would just open up the Bible, they'd read something, they'd talk about it, and then they'd pray. Had a Bible study. People were getting saved left and right. Episcopalian, Lutheran, Catholic, everybody was getting saved. Came to this Bible study. Well, you know, I'm a Christian, I'll come to the Bible study. This guy, man, he was fresh. Talk about hot off the grill. This dude was fresh. What do I teach? Teach the Word. That's what you teach. Jesus went through all, out all the area teaching in their synagogues and preaching. Now, preaching is a little bit different than teaching. Teaching is like A, B, C, 1, 2, 3... Preaching is a little bit different. To preach means to proclaim, to shout it, to herald it out, to tell everybody. Preach. To preach. How many of you are called to preach? Who's called to preach? Raise your hand if you're called to preach. Come here. In the blue shirt there. Come here. We'll have to walk around the camera there. You've got one minute. Preach. In the name of Jesus, <laughs> you must be saved, born again, and filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. You will be. Amen. Ten seconds. Not bad. You can sit down. Give Jesus a hand. Ten second preaching. <laughs> I heard, <laughs> heard this one thing one time. This guy stands out on a corner and there's people walking by. It's a downtown area. It's really busy. And he starts yelling, 18 inches! 18 inches! 18 inches! 18 inches! 18 inches! 18 inches! People are going, what is he talking about? They start coming up, standing around. What? I mean, he's just going crazy. 18 inches! When he gets a crowd, they all get to get, you know, it's like... You're looking at him. He goes, 18 inches between your brain and your heart. And Jesus wants to get into your heart. When are you going to figure it out? 18 inches keeps people from heaven. <laughs> Got an idea. He preached. Some people don't take a whole lot to preach. Just one little idea. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. When you get a hold of what we're talking about here tonight, I mean, it's going to just turn you loose. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. 
He was handed a book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he says in verse 21, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now look closely at this passage. It's in two parts. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Stop. Jesus came and in reading this verse, he was the fulfillment of this passage. And it's in two parts. The first part is what he was anointed to do. The second part, what he was sent to do. The first part he said, I was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Now gospel means good news. Good news. Not bad news. Not you're all going to hell in a basket. That might be truth. But it's sure not good news to a hurting, dying, bleeding, scraping world. They want to hear some good news. Good news. They can be free. God loves them. God wants to help them. God wants to become real to them. That's good news. He said, I have come to, I've been anointed. I've been equipped by the Spirit of God to preach. Everyone say preach. Look at someone else and say preach. preach. Not now. <laughs> Some of you might take off here. <laughs> to preach good news to the poor. What are the poor? People who are without. Without what? Without whatever. Without direction, without guidance, without money, without food, without, without whatever. They're without. Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What did he mean by that? Those without any money? Well, that and... Anybody who's without something of God in their life. Let me tell you, when you're without God, you're poor. I don't care how much money you got. If you don't have God, you're poor. Jesus said, I have been anointed by the Holy Spirit of God to preach good news to the poor. Then he said, He has sent me to... And then he lists them. Heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, open prison doors. Now there's a difference between the two. He's anointed to preach. And when he preaches, the rest is confirmed. That's why it says in Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he starts with. Why does he start with that? Because whatever you preach, you'll see. Whatever you proclaim by the Spirit of God, that's what He's going to bring to pass. You preach healing, healing will come to pass. You preach the blessings of God, and the blessings of God will come to pass. I went to a camp one time in another state, and they had a, they had a prayer line. They had people come forward... And I was up there helping pray for people, much like what we just did here a minute ago. And I went up to this young man, and I started talking to him. I said, what do you want the Lord to do in your life? He said, I, I don't, he was weeping. He said, I don't know. I said, well, what do you believe in God for? He said, well, I just want to be nothing. And I knew where he was coming from, you know. I mean, we want to be hidden in Christ. We want the love of God to shine through us. We don't want to just be all us. We want the Spirit of God to flow through us. So I knew where he was coming from. But the more I talked to him, the more nothingness came out. And I realized that he was part of a program where they preached that you've got to be nothing, just be nothing, and nothing, and nothing. And you know what they'll get as a result of that kind of preaching? Nothing! Nothing! Here's the good news. You are something. Not in yourself, but the closer you get to him, the more you become like him. And then you're really something. 
And if we go around continuously thinking of ourselves, oh, I've got to get out of the way. Oh, I can't be... Oh, I've got to move... Oh, I've got to be nothing. Oh, you know what you're thinking about the whole time? You. But when you're thinking about Him and you're concentrating on Him and you're looking to Him and you're trusting in Him, you know what you're going to be like? Yeah. Him. You get what you preach. The results that happen as a result of what you preach and teach by the anointing of the Spirit of God are in direct relation to one another. You preach healing, you'll see healing. You preach blessings, you'll get blessing. You preach good news, you'll get good news. You preach bad news, you'll get bad news. Bottom line. Do you know why Jesus saw so many good things happening all around him? Because he came preaching good news. Let me shatter a myth for you here for just a second. Jesus Christ was not spooky. You see these old movies of Jesus and he, he's floating about two inches off of the ground, kind of in and out of the rooms, and you got this music playing in the background, and there's this little light, I don't know where does this silly light come from, this little light is on his eyeballs right here, you know, just from somewhere, I don't know, you know. It's Jesus, come heal my daughter. So he comes in and he kind of floats into the room and here's this little girl laying there dead and he walks in and the angels from somewhere are singing, you know. Oh, 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 and Jesus walks up and here's this light on his face and he's going and he talks and it's in an echo. Little girl, 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 arise, rise, rise, rise. And he reaches out and takes her hand and she's going and she rises up. That's not how it happened. It's not. Jesus walked up to the house. Everyone was crying. Oh, she was so young. Oh. Jesus says, why are you crying? She's not dead, she's asleep. And they started to laugh at him. Now how sincere were these people? <laughs> I mean, to go from one to the other just like that, give me a break. Come on. So he kicked them all out. He said, get out of here. You're not helping the situation at all. You're not bringing any good news. Leave the premises. He takes Peter, James, and John, mom and dad, and they go into the room. And Jesus walks up to the little girl, reaches out his hand, and says something all so spiritual. He goes, get up. <laughs> and then, wow, I mean, he shifts into high spirituality and he says, give her something to eat. <laughs> okay, I mean, we're talking very normal here. And if you've got this idea of Jesus, yes, he's holy. Yes, he's seated at the right hand of God. But he's not spooky. And he doesn't talk King James English either. Verily. He doesn't. Sometimes when he talks to me, I'll be going along a certain vein or doing something, and he'll say, oh, stop it. And I'll go, what's that? At least he could have said, stop with it. You know? But he's, he's just so real. He's so real. He had good news and he had good results. Why? Because what he preached is what his ministry bore fruit in. And what you preach is what you're going to see. If you start preaching that your school is in revival, you know what you're going to see? God has always sent his people to proclaim it before it happened. He always has. And 2,000 years ago, God poured out his spirit on all flesh, and God's not, you know, someone who gives something and then takes it back. It's not, oh, I poured out my spirit up. Oh, that's enough. <laughs> we'll give you some sp sprinkles here and there. Sprinkle a day. Let's keep the <laughs> devil away. <laughs> and he just gives you a little here and a little there. 
And some of us are trying to squeak by with that kind of a relationship. God's saying, no, I've poured it out. I've poured it out. I don't know if you young people realize what's going on here, but something's going on here. I mean, the first night we came in here, I was sitting there. I, it was the concert night. Morgan Cryer was up here, and I was just overwhelmed by the spiritual draw that you had on me, and I hadn't even said anything yet. I'm sitting back there in that seat and I'm going <laughs> because you young people you're going I came I want I need I saw oh, give it to me I mean the first night after I preached first night after I preached we're walking back to the apartment room and uh, Cindy goes Spencer you want me to carry you because I was walking like this. Why? Because you guys just drained me. He just took it all. We're not waiting for revival. We're in it. We're not waiting for the Holy Ghost to move. We're in the move of the Holy Ghost. What you preach, you will get. Now that's good news. Makes you think a whole lot about what you're going to preach, doesn't it? Good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. What's good news to a blind man? That he can see. What's good news to someone who's depressed? The joy of the Lord. What's good news to someone who's crippled and can't walk? They can walk. What's good news to someone who doesn't have any money? I was at a church a couple of weeks ago. A young man came up to me afterwards, gave me a check for $100. Teenager. Just wanted to give this to you. I feel like the Lord wanted me to do this. I said, thank you. <laughs> you know, and I blessed him. I prayed with him. I said, Lord, I just ask you to bless him back. Hundredfold in Jesus' name. Just bless him. Tell you what, you don't, you don't have to wait till you get a job to get blessed. Why? Well, you, need, you better learn this before you get a job. Your job won't be your source anyway. It'll just be some place for you to hang out and be a blessing to other people. That paycheck might help a little bit. might be one little area where God... But God wants to pour out His blessings on you. And He wants to use a whole bunch of sources. Amen. Don't limit God to McDonald's. <laughs> MC Donald's. <laughs> you know, stretch yourself out and say, God, how many avenues do you want to bless me through? God, how many directions? I mean, you read Deuteronomy 28, the first 15, 14 verses or so. God wants his blessings to come on you and overtake you. Any of you guys ever play football? You ever been overtaken? You got the ball, and they're trying to overtake you? I mean, you're going as fast as you can, and here come these guys. They're trying to overtake you. That's the blessings of God. Picture this. God's got his blessings out there trying to tackle you. Trying to get you down on the ground so they can bless you. There's more than one. Some of you are going, God, please bless me. God, bless me. And then you turn right around and say, I never get anything. Well, what you preach, you get. But if you stand up and you go... My God supplies all of my needs according to His riches and glory. That's good news. Good news. You can get, you can get what you proclaim by the Spirit of God. But now you notice I say by the Spirit of God on there. Now His Word is by the Spirit of God. So you begin to proclaim His Word and you'll get all the blessings that are in His Word. Don't go out preaching God's going to give me a Lamborghini and you have one so give it to me. Forget that nonsense. That's covetousness. Amen. There's a commandment that says don't do that. Amen. Number 10. Jesus went around teaching and preaching and what else? Amen. Healing. You have resident on the inside of you the ability by the Spirit of God
to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. It's in you. It's inside of you. It's in there. God wants it to come out. If you're becoming more and more like Jesus every day, you're going to see His power flowing through you more and more every day. In Mark 16, it says, These signs follow them that believe. My name they'll cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues. Nothing deadly can hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. These signs follow them that believe. Them that believe what? Them that believe in Jesus? No. Because there's a lot of people who believe in Jesus who never see any of these signs. What does it mean then? These signs follow those who believe that these signs will follow them. Do I need to do that again? These signs, casting out devils, speaking with new tongues, nothing deadly hurting you, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, these signs will follow them that believe that these signs will follow them. If you believe that you can cast out devils, you will. If you believe, I mean, a lot, bunch of you spoke in tongues last night. Why? Faith entered into your heart and you believed it. You did it. Hallelujah. If you believe nothing deadly will hurt you, nothing deadly can hurt you. There was a guy over in the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain and communism when all that stuff was going on. He was a Christian. He was being persecuted for his faith. They brought him before the judge. The judge said, you're a Christian? The man said, yes, I am. He said, do you believe this book called the Bible? He said, yes, I do. The judge said, do you believe this part where it says nothing deadly shall hurt you? He said, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. He said, okay, if you believe it, then you'll take hold of these two live wires with electricity pulsing through them. They brought out these two, I don't know what the voltage was in it, but enough to kill you. They brought out these two wires. He said, if you believe this, if you're a Christian and you believe this, grab these wires. The guy said, okay, in Jesus' name. Remember it says, in my name, you'll cast out devils. Don't try doing stuff without his name. And don't try doing stuff in his name if you don't know him. He said, okay, in Jesus' name. He grabbed the two wires. <clears throat> he blacked out the city. <laughs> now wait. When the lights came back on, they had to, you know, it took a while to get the lights back on because Russia, it's a whole different situation. And if the lights go out, it's a big deal to get everything going back again. They said, well, that was just coincidence. That's what the judge said. That was just coincidence. You know, if someone doesn't want to believe, they're not going to. You can preach the gospel to them and, and let faith do its work, but if they're not going to let it in, it's not going to go in. God doesn't want us to get everyone saved. God wants us to go preach the gospel. He didn't say go save everybody. He said go preach. And some will believe and some won't. Concentrate on the ones who believe. Make them disciples. He said that was just coincidence. If you're really a Christian, do it again. He said, okay, in Jesus' name. And eh, blacked out the city again. They let him go. That was smart. Before he laid hands on them. If you believe that nothing deadly will hurt you, nothing deadly can hurt you. If you believe that. If you believe that you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, it'll work. I was doing a camp in California. About 300 young people there. Service one night, we were just having some testimonies, and all of a sudden it turned into a healing meeting. I mean, it was wild. I had people come forward, they had back problems. A bunch of kids had back problems. I don't know, climbing mountains or something, California. So they came forward, we started praying for them, and this nurse in the back, this lady, she's uh, one of the counselors, she was a nurse, she was in the back, she got mad. She said, Man, they're not praying for me. And while we were praying for people, back there in the back, the Spirit of God healed her. And she knew it. She was a nurse. She knew about this stuff. Healed her. She got excited. She came up to the front and testified about it, told what, you know, we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and 
By the word of our testimony. What is the word of your testimony? What God's done for you? So she came forward and testified. She said, here's what God's done for me. He healed my back. I was back there. I was complaining. I was griping at God. In the midst of my misery, he healed me. So she's up there checking young people. So there were young people there with twisted spine and lupus and all kinds of stuff. And they were getting healed left and right. I mean, it was wild. It was awesome. I was having a blast. This young girl comes up, 16-year-old girl, comes up, had a sweatsuit on. She's just crying. She's just tears running down her face. I said, what do you want Jesus to do for you? See, that's what I like to ask. What do you want Jesus to do for you? That's what Jesus went and asked people. What do you want me to do for you? And whatever they asked him to do, he did it for them. I want to receive my sight. Okay, have some sight. <laughs> Girl comes up, 16-year-old girl, she's crying. I said, what do you want Jesus to do for you? She pulled up the sleeves on her sweatsuit, and her skin was covered with black bumps. She was a white girl. Skin was covered with black bumps. I said, what's going on here? She goes, I've got cancer of the skin. The doctors don't give me any hope. I said, well, Jesus does. In Jesus' name. Be healed. She went out into the power of God. The nurse took her back to the back. They checked her out. She came running up to the front screaming. Pulling up her... I mean, she had this all over her. Pulling up her sleeves. The black bumps were totally gone. She had brand new skin on her arms and on her legs. Brand new skin. Brand new skin. She was healed. She was healed. <laughs> I love it young man down in the Houston area when he was a little boy, his name was Ronnie Coyne some of you might have heard of him when he was a little boy he was in some little situation in the backyard and his eye got poked out and they took him to the doctor and, and they worked on him, they couldn't save his eye it was too bad so they gave him a glass eye, he had a glass eye and a woman by the name of Catherine Kuhlman, you might have heard of her, had a powerful healing ministry 20, you know, so years ago. Well, this little guy, he's about eight years old, has a glass eye. His mom heard about the meeting, heard about what was going on. She brought her son to the meeting, but it was full. No one else, they wouldn't let anyone in. They locked the doors. No one else could get in. It was standing room only. After a little, they waited outside the door. After a little while, some of the ushers came to the door, opened up the door and says, Miss Coleman will pray for some of the serious cases that are out here and couldn't get in. Right now, come with me. So they went with him, and he got him up on the stage, and they lined everybody up, those serious situations, and here's Ronnie Coyne and his mom standing behind him, and she's going by, Catherine Coleman's going by, laying hands on him and praying for him, and God's healing him. So she comes by and uh, looks at the mom like, you know, what does he need? And the mom just quickly hit his sight. So she goes, receive your sight in Jesus' name. And kept going and praying for everybody. Then she would come back through and check everybody. She came back through, got to Ronnie, and the mom tried to explain it. Well, you know, uh, he's got a glass eye, and, you know, Catherine Kuhlman said, it doesn't matter. Bring out the eye chart. They brought out an eye chart, set it on the stage, got little Ronnie over there, covered up his eye, and he read the entire eye chart through that glass eye. But they didn't stop there. She said, take out the eye. I mean, if you have a glass eye, you can take it out and you can clean it and, you know, Windex, I don't know. So they took out the glass eye. They, Ronnie covered up his eye and he read the chart again through an empty socket. How could he do that? She didn't pray for God to give him a new eye. She prayed for God to give him sight. Sight. Sight without an eye. Now imagine hearing without an ear, talking without a tongue, thinking without a brain. Some of you can imagine that. God is so big. So big. 
<laughs> We're on the verge of seeing the greatest miracles that have ever happened on the planet. They're happening in the earth today. And if you hadn't seen one yet, don't worry about it. You will. You're going to see it maybe out of your hands. I've got good news for you tonight. Jesus can heal your body. I've got good news for you tonight. Jesus can change your heart and your life. Spencer and Cindy Nordyke, Reaching Nations and Generations. For more information, visit NordykeMinistries.com.